I scream this from the rooftops. People don't understand that if you don't back entrepreneurs who are thinking about diversity early on, you are locking yourself into a limited pool of people that you're going to be able to hire. Peter Sanington, your big game hunter. And guys, we have our sights on someone special <laughs> no, Only a mother could invest in this idea. made <laughs> this, <laughs> like super artistic. <laughs> that is actually absolutely correct. Um, and that's a very, very astute assessment, actually. Welcome, everybody, to the VC Hunting Show with me, your big game hunter, Peter Sanikin. I am super excited for our guest today. It is Ryan Floyd, the founding managing director of Storm Ventures. He's been there a while. Storm Ventures focuses on early stage enterprise SaaS applications, cloud, and infrastructure companies. If you don't know of Ryan Floyd, he's also on the YouTubes with a YouTube channel called Ask a VC. And if he ain't there, he's probably out surfing. So Ryan, thanks so much for joining the show. Good to be up here. Thanks. Well, let's just jump right in. I am really curious about your story of moving into venture capital. You've been there for a while, but if you could give us a, give us a little snippet. How did you get into venture capital? And why is it so intriguing for you? Well, I, you know, my story is maybe, well, maybe everybody's story is unique, I suppose, but <laughs> it's not the, not the typical path. So um, I was, um, I started out my career uh, basically as an SDR doing cold calling for a big private equity firm. And um, I was basically, I was a salesperson and um, it was a, just a fantastic job at Summit Partners. <clears throat> and I was there for a few years and I ended up joining a portfolio company of theirs that was an optics company called eTech Dynamics. And we took that company public in 1998 and I ran business development there. We took it public and then we sold it uh, a bit later in 2000 to a large company called JS Uniface. And uh, it was a very it was a large exit. And uh, I, I, because of my time at Summit, I knew about venture, although venture was not what it is today. Mm. Uh, this was you know, 20 years ago. Um, and the uh, CFO, COO at eTech, who I worked for, he and I had spent a lot of time looking at startups at the time. And I think we came to the conclusion there was a need for an early stage firm that really knew what they were investing against, that had, had some uh, domain expertise. And we got together with uh, two other folks that he knew um, and, uh, and started Storm in, in, in 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, and raised the fund and you know, off, off to the races. And I, it, it's an, I, I think what's, what's perhaps even more interesting is that, you know, for those that know the history of the Valley in 2000, we had just an epic collapse in the market. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm very fortunate the way the timing worked out because when we raised the fund, we raised it when people were still flush with cash and they were interested in us investing. Okay. 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 Uh, and this was in, this was in 2000. Right. And by the end of 2000, I sort of remember uh, Nortel missed its numbers in Q4. This is a telco up in Canada that's right. since gone bankrupt. And um, uh, that was the beginning of the end. And <laughs> by March of 01, uh, the, the, it was over. I mean, the Valley was done. The party was over. Everybody right. had a hangover. And uh, we would not have been able to raise money had we not closed the fund in 2000. And then of course 9-11 happened as well and it just you know, completely decimated all the markets. Uh, With that being said, what's interesting, the other piece of this, we were able to raise the fund because we got in early, but if we had tried to raise the fund two years earlier or a year earlier, it's likely we would have invested in a lot of really terrible companies. <laughs> and we would have lost a lot of money and it's not likely we would have been given another chance to invest. You know, no one would have entrusted us with their money mm -hmm. after that. So the timing is really pretty remarkable too, that this six to nine month window, and uh, I'm still very grateful for it today. And we were able to generate a nice return on that first fund, uh, despite the, the terrible events of you know, 2000. And, and that was actually one of my first follow-up questions there, Ryan, is because I've looked in and I saw, hey, you started this in 2000. I mean, the timing. I, yeah. when, when you said they were still flush with cash, it surprised me a little bit because I was under the assumption, it's like, okay, okay, where, where in 2000 was it? But I guess things hadn't truly bottomed out just yet. And, and so, wow, it's amazing that timing. You did bring up this idea of saying venture then versus venture now. Now, 
being in venture from 2000 to basically 2020, we're rolling up on it, aren't we? Um, I mean, what has changed that? What, what in your mind, mind's eye has changed significantly before you started venture in 2000 uh, to where you are today, being a 20, almost a 20 year veteran now, what do you think has been the biggest change to venture capital? Well, we could, we could talk for an hour just on, just on that. Um, but let me try to, let me just kind of maybe pull a few thoughts out on that one. So what are the, yeah, yeah the, like the first thing that's remarkable to me about venture is today versus then is what, what venture investors will fund today. Venture investors will fund uh, health food snack companies to <laughs> taxi hailing apps to supersonic airplanes. To not real meat. To not real meat, <laughs> uh, cars, space travel, you name, there's nothing that is out of bounds anymore for a venture investor, which, which is pretty remarkable. That just, that, that would not have hunted at all 20 years ago. Uh, it was very constrained what people thought were venture backed businesses and could have venture economics. So that's really changed uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, the other thing I think has changed quite a bit uh, is that, you know, in 20 years ago, it was a club. I mean, it was a very, it was a very small group of people uh, that invested that generally, and it was part of the reason we started Storm, I think generally didn't necessarily understand a lot of the technology. They often had like a banking background oh, or yeah. general business background. And, um, and it was a very small group of people and you'd sort of club up these deals because no one had a big enough fund to fund and everything. And so people wanted to like syndicate and uh, it was very, very clubby. Today, uh, I, I know a lot of people would argue that it's still clubby, but certainly compared to 20 years ago, <laughs> it, it, it has no resemblance at all. For sure. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the ability, I think, for entrepreneurs to get in front of most venture firms, uh, a lot of them has really changed. I mean, entrepreneurs now understand venture. It's not this like mysterious thing. How does it work? What do these people do all day? There's lots of content out there, like, like your show here in terms of how it works. And, you know, I think that's, that's helped entrepreneurs, uh, just, you know, get access that maybe they didn't used to have. We still have a little ways to go there. Uh, it's not perfect. You just look at the founders that receive venture funding today and there's still some work to do there, but it's dramatically different than what it was 20 years ago. And I, and let me just ask this question cause I couldn't find it online. Why the name storm ventures? Now, well, I mean, storm can, I mean, it, yeah, I'll let you explain it. I'm not going to put any, no, I love it. it's a good question. Yeah. Cause it's, it's not obvious. Um, it, yeah, it's so, not. So people talk about the PayPal mafia, right? That's everybody talks about that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Turns out PayPal did not have the first mafia, right? Most large tech companies that have come out of Silicon Valley all have, have massive networks uh, that sort of persist through time. For sure. A very successful networking company was a company called Stratacom. Okay. Uh, and Stratacom way back in the day did ATM frame relay. Networking. It was basically the, the, the basis for WAN networking. All right. And um, uh, my partner Sanjay was the uh, was one of the first employees there. Dick Moley, who's a venture partner here, was CEO there. Alex Mendez, who is one of my uh, partners here, was VP of marketing. And Tehi Nam, who still runs the firm with me today, uh, incorporated them when he was an associate at Wilson Sunseen. Oh wow! A, a law firm. And. Uh, and so that's the storm team, uh, uh, you know, 20 years ago when we started and, uh, the, the name storm comes from Stratacom when I went public, the ticker symbol was S T R M. Okay. And back, back then, uh, there was no electronic trading. So traders had to yell across the trading floor. And so they came up with, you know, you can't yell S T R M. So they'd come up with something with a vowel so you could, you could yell it uh. and they would yell storm. So Storm was the basically what the Stratacom uh, trades were, and that's what we ended up incorporating. Stratacom ultimately went public and then was acquired by Cisco. And I think but in terms of market cap, it's still the largest acquisition Cisco's ever made. It was about 10% of Cisco's market cap at the time, and still today forms the backbone of uh, Cisco's WAN business. Wow, what a unique story, man. Yeah, that's yeah, really so, cool. Yeah, so yeah. We, we've talked Maybe about... <laughs> Yeah, well, it's not too ancient history, maybe ancient history to some, but it, it, I, you talked about, you know, be, the venture capital in the past being kind of like a, like old, old, old men's club, like a, a club of sorts to, yep. to today. Certainly, there's certainly more access, there's more opportunity, there's more 
platforms where people can get informed about venture capital, all these types of things. But I want to bring it back to you guys here at Storm. How are you guys doing it differently in the 20, the 2019s, 2020s? And how, how have you, what, what's something that you can be proud of that you guys are doing differently than the old clubs back in the day? Well, I think the first, the first thing we do differently today is, you know, I, I think we're investing against a thesis in an area around B2B SaaS hmm. rather than just, uh, you know, uh, somebody who knows someone else. I think, you know, in that network where you're only funding entrepreneurs or friends of friends, <laughs> that can lead to a very insular sort of funding strategy because- And an insecure it, funding strategy, to be honest. And maybe, and maybe insecure too, but even putting results- uh, and returns aside, it certainly leads to probably a, you know, a, a, a not a very, you know, broad kind of, you know, looking portfolio. For sure. Um, and, um, and so I think today, because partly due to the fact that there's so many incubators out there, you know, most of the deal flow today still comes from like referrals, but I wouldn't say it's like people that other people know really well and have worked with for like 15 years. Mm. So I think we're much more open today to looking at, um, uh, you know, entrepreneurs that have started things that are in our sector uh, in our focus area. Part of that's because we're very focused. We just do B2B enterprise SaaS. And so I think we're very comfortable with those markets. And if we can see entrepreneurs that are finding success there, we can correlate maybe better than we could 20 years ago. Because 20 years ago, you know, it was so expensive to get a company off the ground. You really had to take a massive leap of faith. I mean, all these things we take for granted today AWS and Google Compute and right, Gmail. Right. I mean, even setting up an email server was like an act of God 20 years ago, right? No. I, mean, I mean, this was a this was this was a lot of work 20 years ago, and now today, I mean, it's just it's so easy. So getting an application put together today is just it costs a lot less, you know, money than it once did. So I think you know that's a big advantage, and we're trying to take it, you know, to take take that opportunity and run with it today as a as a venture firm. Um, yeah. I was, I was going to say, I know, and, and I, we would probably end up getting here anyway, but I know that, that Storm Ventures, maybe, maybe it's just maybe your, your addition to Storm Ventures, is that Storm Ventures supports Code 2040, and maybe that's just you, but it supports minorities in, in, in tech. And, and, I, and I think by doing a little bit of research, I remember seeing a Medium article um, not too long ago from August, yes, August 28th, you, you wrote an article on August 28th of this year, 2019, why we need to give more funding to female entrepreneurs. I'm going to quote you here. It says, at Storm Ventures, we aim to work with portfolio companies that understand, uh, understand and embrace the value of diversity. Stronger business, stronger business and stronger diversity is stronger investing for us. Do you still yeah. hold to this? Do you still hold yeah. to this? I mean, this, I scream this from the rooftops. I think People don't understand that if you don't back entrepreneurs who are thinking about diversity early on, you are locking yourself into a limited pool of people that you're going to be able to hire. There, in my opinion, there is a reason why Facebook has a diversity problem. And it's not because Mark Zuckerberg or Sheryl Sanders doesn't, <laughs> doesn't, doesn't, doesn't think that diversity is important. They do. I really believe they do. But the problem is that company is very white and very male. And, and, and if you're a person of color and you're an awesome programmer, that may not be the environment you want to work in, right? It might be, but it may not be, right? Because it's just they haven't really, from the very beginning, when they were 10 people, they didn't focus on that. So I try really hard with our company. I'm not running the company, so hmm. there's a limit to what I can do. But I try really hard to push on that because – I think it drives an ability to hire better people ultimately and to build a stronger company. So oh, absolutely, you know, it's really, it's really as simple as that. And the way I do you know, I, I'll give you an example. I won't name the company, but there's a company that put up, they were very proud of their SDR team and they put up this picture of the board meeting of this SDR team and it was all white males. <laughs> and, and you know, I think it was like six, maybe eight. And I, and I, and I told the CEO, I said, you got to change that. Because if you don't change that now, you're never going to be able to change it. You can't wake up one day and say, I believe in diversity and try to change things. Mm. It's very hard to do that. So I think it starts at the very beginning. And I, I view that's just a small thing I can do as an investor to really try and, you know, uh, get our companies to understand that. That it's not about, it's, it's not about just trying to, you know, 
uh, embrace diversity. Mm. It's about building the best team that you can build for success. And I really and, and and people really should go to your Medium article, uh, Ryan, on about this uh, title: Why We Need to Give More Funding to Female Entrepreneurs. Because you actually lay out a really significant case for this. Um, it's just it's diversity is a stronger business case, and that that to you equals a stronger investment. And so it makes a lot of sense. Now, going back in history and, and going through your history, this was kind of a progressive revelation of sorts. You weren't talking about this in the in the 09s and the 10s and even maybe even the 12s on Twitter or, or Medium or anything like this. What, what, what changed? What, what was an experience that you had that brought about this? Because looking back, I can see that you're, you're part of Code 2040, which I said be, before supports minorities in tech. Um, why is this important to you? Why, why has this become important to you uh, during this time of your life? Well, I think there's, there's probably a, a personal and a professional bit to that. So um, I don't talk about it often, but uh, on the personal side, um, I, you know, I'm in a mixed race family. So my wife is black. And uh, as a result, you know, we have three wonderful children and, and I do, you know, and, and, and they're teenagers now. And, and I do think Congratulations about- Congratulations, making it. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and I do think about what the world will be for them as they grow up mm. and, and how important it is on a very personal level uh, for me to do everything I can uh, to not only make them successful, but also- also have other people view them as equals and, and to think about them in the same way they might think about me as a white male. So, so, so that's on a very, you know, personal level. And, you I know, appreciate I, that. I really do. I really appreciate that candor, man. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and, and so I've tried now as I've gotten to a place at storm, uh, where I can have more of an impact, uh, to, you know, now I think to professionally embrace a lot more of that, it's always been important to me, but I could never stand it. You know, it, you haven't asked me, but, but if you asked me, you know, hey, Ron, how, how many, you know, female founders have, have you backed at Storm? You know, if you would have asked me that question a couple of years ago, I would have had a terrible answer because my answer probably would have been pretty close to zero. Right. Okay. In 2010, it would have been probably pretty close to zero. In fact, I think in 2010, it would have been zero. Mm. But today, I'm pretty happy about the fact it's pretty close to 10, you know, probably 10%, maybe a little bit above 10%. It's not where we need to be. It's not where I'd like to be, but it is a heck of a lot better than where it was uh, 10 years ago. And that awareness that, you know, I think we've been able to, 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 to bring into venture. So I think, it, I just feel like today I'm able to talk about it more because I've been able to do things. We've got a more diverse team. We've always had, it's always been interesting at Storm. We have a founder from Argentina, uh, Argentina one a founder from India, a founder from, uh, Korea, and then myself, um, all male, uh, but very different uh, backgrounds. Mm. Uh, you know, today- maybe, partner, maybe we should have those guys on the show. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Um, my partner, Tehi, uh, uh, and I run the, run the fun. And then we have Arun as a partner, uh, you know, uh, and then uh, Frederick, uh, who's uh, black, and Pascal, who's our first female on the investment team. Awesome. So, I think, so I think we've been able to, you know, make, I think being able by having that sort of right mindset, find incredible people to continue to build storm. Well, you are making a very, very solid case for storm ventures. So my next question here then is who, sh what type of individuals are you looking uh, to apply to storm ventures for financing and funding? Obviously context, early stage, enterprise SaaS application cloud and infrastructure, but beyond, right, beyond the front facade of, of what you support and what you invest in, what type of individuals are you looking for? So, um, you know, the first filter that we look at is, as you said, it's got to be B2B enterprise mm -hmm. SaaS, and you'd be amazed at how many people send me a note on LinkedIn or email wanting me to look at their company and it's a consumer business. Right. Look, I, it may be interesting, intellectually interesting, but we're not going to fund it right? Because we just don't do it, no matter how exciting it is. The second thing we look for is a little bit of product market fit. And that's usually some revenue, 50 to $100,000 a month uh, or so uh, of recurring revenue. Uh, and the reason for that is, um, so some traction. I don't think, some tra traction. And the reason for that is, I don't think we're particularly good at helping really early stage SaaS businesses find that product market fit when they have Ooh. no customers at all. Ooh. Because 
and we can talk a little bit about that, but I think it, it is much harder for seed investors to really help there on the B2B side, I think. Uh, uh, however, once you get to 50 or $100,000 in revenue, I think we're as good as it gets in terms of helping go to market. That's We've been investing all of our time in figuring out how to take a company that's at a million dollars of revenue and scale to 20, 50, 100, and we're really, really good at that because we can take all the lessons and everything mm -hmm. we've done in the past and across the portfolio and apply it there and really help kind of figure out how to scale versus a product. It's a little bit more of a snowflake in terms of what, what, what works. And, and I mean, we can be helpful in terms of how to find it, who to talk to. So I'm maybe, you know, I'm, I'm maybe exaggerating a bit. I mean, I think we can be helpful at the early stage, but I think we can, we can be much more impactful on the good well, I, I, I'm, I wouldn't want you to backpedal there because I actually appreciated that conceit. Uh, I, I think w w what I appreciate about the conceit is that you, they're really, well, let's just, let's just go, let's just go right to it. I, I had a, uh, I had a quote here from November 4th, 2019, a perfect segue. Yeah, Ryan, you, mu you must do the YouTube thing. Perfect segue. So this is an interesting conceit that you said that, hey, look, we might not really want to focus and help you try to find your product market fit. Come to us with product market fit, come to us with some traction, and then we're really going to be cooking with fire. And the reason why this is a great quote, uh, a great uh, segue is on November 4th, 2019, not too long ago, you said when ideas are met with skepticism, right? You just have to remember that nobody knows anything. Nobody knows anything. And I think that's a really unique conceit to say, hey, look, if you're in the early stage, you're a B2B company and you're, and you're trying to find product market fit, nobody really knows anything and we don't either. We would love to be able to help you, but you guys over 20 years at Storm Ventures have really kind of honed your craft, honed your thesis, and probably what came out of you when you said that was your thesis. It's like, we love to work with B2B companies, but you got to have a little bit of traction. We're yeah, I mean, just to, just to allow just to elaborate on that, um, the, the, the general thrust behind that is, I mean, obviously people know some things, but <laughs> For sure. know, product, product is an area that everybody can have an opinion about, right? I can have an opinion about lots of products out there, whether it's good or bad or whatever. It doesn't necessarily mean, though, it's an educated and an informed opinion. Mm. And I think, you know, that's the big, get, that's, that's where I struggle sometimes on the really, really early companies because I'm not out interviewing the customers. I'm not out having those conversations and really trying to understand all that. I mean, obvious things, yes, how to, how to think about the business, how to build it, yes, all that, you know, that translates. But it's more around that. And I think, you know, too often entrepreneurs, uh, you know, they hear feedback that it doesn't make sense. And what they really ought to listen for is, is that feedback they're getting from someone that necessarily understands it better than them mm -hmm. for some reason? Absolutely. Because, you know, a, a, people share opinions freely, as you know. <laughs> Every, everybody has lots of opinions about things. And I think, you know, you have to be, you know, somewhat careful in terms of what, you know, what you listen to and why and being, you know, be thoughtful about it. The same is true in my business too, you know, in terms of investing, you know, sometimes we do diligence and truth be told, sometimes we get opinions from people that say, that's a terrible idea. Why would you guys invest in that? And, you know, and sometimes we seek out opinions that likely are going to be negative because it, it forces us to have more conviction, right? For sure. About what, we, what we're going to invest in, but yeah, you just got to be you know thoughtful about it. Everybody's got an opinion. Well, I think I think I I love I love your response. I, I think they're not again not everyone knows everything, but this at the same at the same time I think there's a lot to be said that you guys have been doing this for a while. You have experience. You pattern recognition, right? You'd rather work with. You know, a, a stack of, you know, a stack of bricks with lots of, lots of leaves and lots of, lots of powder, dry powder, rather than try to help you figure it out through the wilderness. And I think that's okay. One thing that I was talking about with another VC just the other day was the fact that a lot of founders and entrepreneurs don't realize that there's a game to be played on the venture capital side. You guys have a strategy. You have tactics. You have, Absolutely. you have returns that you want to see. I mean, yeah. you're doing the math. You're saying, Hey, if I'm going to give you $5 million and I want to 10 X this thing, is this, is what you're doing a, you know, 250 million, 500 million. If not, I'm not going to give you $5 million, right? It's not worth it to me. So I think it's, it's also, it's important to know that. And I think I appreciate you saying it, that your thesis and the way that you guys operate storm, it needs to be taken into account from the, from the founder side as well. Yeah. Is that fair? 
Yes, and I think it's that's a great point because it is true. Like we, we, you know, we have a thesis, we have a way, a strategy that we're thinking about, as you said, to try and generate returns. In fact, we're even we have even more conviction about that today than we did ten years ago because we know it delivers returns. So we know how to, you know, uh, what at least has worked for us. We're trying to really make that even better as we go forward, and I think it's working. But as a result, it is, you know, it's it's a it's a mindset that we have. It doesn't mean someone else's mindset couldn't be right, right? And a lot of seed investors are fantastic, right? And they have a whole strategy about how they do that, and that's awesome. Or a late stage investor, they have a whole strategy that's great. You know, I, I think back to your earlier question about what's changed in venture, right? The requirement around specialization because it is so competitive. You know, I I think from at least from my standpoint, uh, it's it's really it's really gone up. So you know, we're much more specialized, much more focused today. Uh, I, th I think I think you guys uh, have had to be, and and if we trace the if we trace the kind of the trajectory of Silicon Valley as opposed to let's say other places like Austin, Texas, or or Seattle, or even New York City for that matter, right? In in these some of these other places of venture capital, there's a more of a generalist approach because there's not enough saturation like a B to B or a B to C. Right. But right. in the Valley, since there's such a saturation, you've had to segment out specialization, yeah. and that makes a lot of sense, right? Yep. Exactly. Yep. So I want to pivot just a little bit because you, we, we were, you had just made a comment about everyone's got an opinion. Certainly this is the internet guys. Everyone has an opinion. Everyone has a voice. I got a YouTube channel. Yeah. And that's okay. what I want to go into. So what, what got into you? What got into you, Ryan, to start a YouTube channel, which by the name is great name. Ask a VC. Tell us about that. What, what got you into the, the hard knocks game of YouTube life? <laughs> Well, um, I've been, uh, you know, writing content like the articles you referenced and, you know, for years, right? Since we started. Mm -hmm. And, and a prolific tweeter, by the way. From uh, I, I, yeah, I, I, tweet, I tweet a bit. Um, not as much as some venture investors, but, but uh, I tweet a bit. Uh, um, and I have an easy handle, uh, Ryan Floyd. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think what I, I was on youtube one day i'm a big sailor and so i consume a lot of weird sailing content on youtube it's really the only place i can get it and uh uh i did a search around SaaS, and there was just nothing there there was no content and i look at my kids they just they watch youtube nonstop um <laughs> and online videos so i kind of you know i just thought i'd give it a try and see whether or not it would work and uh i got you know pretty good feedback and and it's been fun and um, it's been a fun experiment to learn a new medium and see how it works. It's been fun to get in front of a camera and to learn that whole kind of new skill set and how, you know, I, you know, funny enough, I kind of understand now what producing means. I understand what directing means. I never really understood any of those concepts, but it's awesome, but I understand them now what they mean. It's a lot of work. Um, and, uh, and it's also been fun just to see my kids are horrified to see me on YouTube. Uh, they just, you know, they, they just, it's like, they think it's absolutely cringeworthy and uh, they think my titles are terrible, that I need to have more titles like how to get rich quick. Uh, <laughs> that, those are the kind of titles that everybody wants to see. So anyway, it's been fun. It's been fun. Well, I love the fact that you're leveraging the community and leveraging your Twitter and leveraging other, other mechanisms for getting feedback um, for your for what you're going to discuss, so I I love that aspect. Well, have you set a time time box for how long you're going to try this experiment, or is this going to be one of those things where you just continue to do it until you get bored of it? Because yeah, as, I mean, as you as you have said, it is tough. It's tough, man. It's tough to do it. Yeah, it's tough to. I mean, I think as long as I'm having fun, and um, you know, and it and it's like you said, it's it's sort of you know working with Storm and the community, then you know it's all good. And I think, you know, I'll get like anything, it's hard now, but I think I'll get better at it over time as I do it a little bit more. And I'm going to start, uh, just like you're doing here, I'm going to start doing some interview style thing. In fact, I got my first videos on the interview coming out uh, probably in a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, and I think that'll, that'll be fun too, kind of a different format. Because I just, I think getting this content out to entrepreneurs, I mean, that's what gets me excited. Like, it's so hard for an entrepreneur to go to a conference, to sit and listen to a panel, it, there's no reason. I mean, this was kind of, I guess, part of my, my latest inspiration on it. Conferences are great for networking, mm. but they're really tough if you're trying to sit there and really absorb a panel. Right. They can be. And there's no reason why that content ought just not to be available to everyone. 
that doesn't need to pay, you know, $300 or whatever, and then whatever airfare, whatever to go to a conference. So I think, you know, getting more of that content out there for people to, uh, to sift through and keep it pretty high quality and keep it really focused around B2B SaaS. That's what I'm going to try and do. Well, I love it. And, and I'm going to have to give you a lot of credit here because I've done some search and we do some digging here at VC Hunting. And Ryan, you are a prolific and disciplined content producer. I, I really have to say that. Having wa- gone through your Twitter, gone through your medium, you have a, a discipline to content production. You even wrote a post on it. All the way back, guys, we're going medium, January 25th, 2017, uh, almost three years now. You wrote a post called Content Marketing, How to Create Great Campaigns. And you talked about three things, authenticity, objectivity, and cadence. Authenticity, you definitely have because with, with your writing and even with your Ask a VC, you're t- ridiculously authentic. I just love watching you. Objectivity, uh, that's hard. We all have some sort of subjectivity, but cadence. I think I want to talk about cadence. I have seen that you've had a discipline with cadence with, with uh, content production for years now. And I want to ask you a, a question that probably a lot of people in the content world are struggling with. How do you keep producing content? How do you stay motivated? Because you've done it on so many different mediums for so many different years. I love that you you're have this beginner's mindset with YouTube and you're saying, I'm learning this and it's fun. How do you stay motivated? It's amazing. Well, I, you know, I, well, I appreciate you saying all those, all the, all the kind words. Uh, you know, I'm certainly don't feel like I'm even, you know, top quartile of prolific <laughs> content producers uh, out of the venture community. But, um, you know, I think how I, I stay motivated. It's the same thing that kind of keeps me motivated at, at Storm. I mean, you, to be a venture investor, I think to be good beyond being optimistic and, you know, having some, you know, business discipline, like you really got to be into learning because mm-hmm. if, you, if you're not, then it's just, it's, it's kind of, it's not a fun job because I'm constantly being put in situations where I'm not the expert and I've got to, you know, get as smart as I can on a sector or on a, you know, on a, whatever, a particular approach as fast as I can. And so I think for me, the content is really about that learning. It's about that process. And, you know, whether it's in observing best practices at a portfolio company and trying to, you know, kind of more generalize that and share it or, or, you know, specific experiences I've had or, you know, questions that I get asked repeatedly and, and, and really trying to help others that are on that journey. Uh, you know, that's what kind of keeps, keeps me going. Oh man, that's awesome. What a great response. Well, I'm going to finish us out here with one final question because this is a really intriguing tweet that you made uh, from December 17th, Uh-oh. 2015. Uh-oh. We're going oh, no. way back here. Oh no. You Don't said... Let- don't those don't those Twitter things get deleted at some point or what? <laughs> no, man, we do some digging. But this is part of actually, to be quite frank, this is actually one of the things that I that I really want to do with with this show is I want to keep venture capitalists accountable. Yeah, hold I us wanna, accountable. I wanna, Amen. Right? Amen. So yeah. December fifteenth, December seventeenth, two thousand fifteen. You said wealth is not the measure of a person. Period. All right, Ryan. <laughs> What's the measure of a person? Well, I, you know, I think the measure of a person, I, it's going to depend on, you know, person to person. I, I, it's kind of, a, I mean, it's a very personal question, right? In terms of what do you value? And I think for sure values and integrity, you know, and, and it, it is a very personal question. I don't remember that specific tweet per se, but I think too often in society, we take people who are wealthy, we take their opinions and we believe somehow mm. these people are smarter than everybody else. And it's really not a measure of a person. I mean, I think, you know, very few people recognize that when they do find wealth, myself included, that it has a lot to do like where I started with luck and circumstance. You know, not only was I born a white male, but I told you that story that when we started Storm, I was very fortunate with the timing. If I had been a year later, it would have been a different trajectory. Now, it doesn't say I wouldn't have been successful. Who knows? But I was fortunate with what, with what happened. Right. I just think, you know, the measure of a person can't be well. I mean, the measure of a person has to be the values and the integrity and the actions that that person takes. So let's make it personal. Then, let's make it so, personal. What would be, what would be yeah. the measure of your life? If you, if you could, if you could go out and in the future and, you, and, and, and have your tomb and write your own tombstone of sorts, what would be the measure of your life? <laughs> I'm asking you some tough questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, 
the, you didn't ask me this earlier. Like you didn't, you know, these are questions that take a little bit of, a little bit of thought. I don't sit around pondering what's the measure of my life. I will tell you it's, it's, it's changed over the years. That's probably the best way to answer it. It's changed over the years. So I was incredibly driven and competitive at all costs when I was younger. In, Being in, in, in I, sales? You, I bet you succeeded being in, in academics and then, and then, and then in sales and just personally, I, I did a lot of climbing, you know, just in different, all the different aspects of my life. And I think now today, you know, I value a lot more things about, you know, am I a good father? Am I a good husband? Mm. Right. Uh, do, do people want to work with me as well as obviously the hard measure of, do I generate returns back to our, our, do I produce the money work in the med- but I think, you know, it's that old saying, you know, that, you know, when, when people are sort of on their deathbed, they, you know, they don't wonder whether or not they should have spent another couple hours in the office, right? They look at love, relationships, the, the people that they've surrounded themselves with. And so that's where a lot of my, you know, focus and intention is today. I love it. I love it. Well, thanks so much for that. I know it was a tough question, but I was like, man, I mean, you must have had a moment in December in 2015. You're just like, wealth is not the measure of man. Boom. It must have been, it must have been a response to some billionaire tweeting some opinion about something. I don't know. <laughs> you gotta look, for Twitter, you got to look at the context because it's often around the context. But that is yeah. true. That is true. Maybe it was an unfair gotcha moment. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us in this episode of VC Hunting with me, my Peter Saddington, and Ryan Floyd. You can find more information about Ryan at stormventures.com. Thanks so much for joining the show, Ryan. Thanks, Peter. All right. Take care. Wow. I really enjoyed that conversation with Ryan. What a great guy. What a great communicator. I really enjoyed that conversation. I hope you guys do, did too with Ryan Floyd from Storm Ventures. You know, there's a couple things that I really wanted to kind of pull out of Ryan during this conversation. And I think we got a little bit of it. A couple of things that I wanted to pull out was around his YouTube channel. He is a prolific tweeter. He is a prolific blogger. He writes a lot and he's out there. He's expressing his opinions, his ideas. And I really appreciated that about him. And I know, as you guys can see clearly here, I know what it takes to start a, a, a YouTube channel, a, a media syndication system. I know what it takes and I know it's hard. It's hard to grow. It's hard to begin. It's hard to, to get feedback that you don't like early in the game. And I really appreciated that uh, Ryan was willing to talk about his beginning mindset, his beginner mindset and, and getting feedback from his daughters and saying that his titles aren't great and they're not as clickbaity as they need to be. But it really shows. I think it really is evidence that Ryan is a guy who really enjoys the process of learning. And if you were to track through, like I have, as, a, as the VC hunter going through his tweets, going through his blog, going through his history, he really has led a life by learning. He enjoys the process of learning. He enjoys getting in there. And he's learned enough, especially for his, uh, his type of thesis uh, with Storm Ventures, early stage B2B that he's learned enough that that's his wheelhouse, that's where he does his best work. One of the things that I really appreciated is his candor and honesty around his personal life. Uh, being part of a multi-racial family uh, is really, really unique. It has its perks, it has its, it has its uh, aesthetics to it that give in individuals insights to the world that many of us, if we're not part of a biracial or multiracial family, we just don't know about. I've been blessed and fortunate enough to be part of a multi biracial, multiracial, whatever you want to call it, family. I've been part of, I have a huge extended family of lots of different nationalities, and I tell you, it brings the world to you. It opens up the doors, and I, I think Ryan said it really well there, that it gives you opportunities to be more successful. It gives you opportunities to, to see things from different perspectives and to be, and, and Storm Ventures isn't a diversity fund, but what Ryan has articulated is that having, a, having openness to diversity, well, it just makes better investments. It just makes for better investments. So I really, really appreciated his honesty around that. I also, uh, we were talking uh, just a little bit about um, uh, the last question that I asked him about. He, he said on December 17th, 2017, 2015, wealth is not the measure of man. I asked him, okay, so what is? 
I wasn't there, I wasn't there to, to catch him off guard, but I told him that, hey, some of these questions, you, they tend to be awkward, and, and if people get, if they think too much about it, then it becomes off as an inauthentic answer. But I really appreciate that he focused on that, hey, maybe in his, in his earlier years, he was driven, he was passionate, he was all about go, 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 and these days, he's more interested in ensuring that he's a good father, a good dad. Things that, you know, being a father and being a husband, I think probably are the more important things in life. I hope you guys really appreciate and enjoyed this conversation that I had with Ryan Floyd from Storm Ventures. You can find more information about Ryan and this episode on vchunting.com slash Ryan Floyd. Thanks so much for being here, guys. I can't wait to have more shows coming up for you guys. We got some great invitations sent out and we got some great acceptances. Also, make sure you check out our newsletter. Kind of important, guys. We'll see you in the next one.